Hi, this is Mike from Microsoft Marks and Reviews and How To, and on today's video we're going to take a look at possibly one of the most frustrating devices I've ever seen in my life for an M.2 drive. But it may just save your bacon. Keep watching to find out more. Okay, so in today's video we're taking a look at this. This is the Sabrent. It's got an unusual name. It is the ECPCIE. Very uh, descriptive part number. Well done, Sabrent. You've uh, outdone yourselves there. So what is this? This is a M.2 mounting enclosure, which translates to a PCI Express bus type connection. So if you've got a spare PCI Express slot on your motherboard, now it does have to be a 16 times slot size, which is going to really rule this out for some people. I'm not too sure where they've gone with the 16x type size, but I guess it does make some sense. It's easy to actually locate it into the motherboard because you can use the clip for the graphics card to actually hold the unit in place. So yeah, it does help in that. So you don't need to actually screw into a PCI Express. So if you have got a smaller form factor PC, you don't have a full size slot, then this was going to actually do the job very nicely. Also, it's actually quite discreet. Once it's actually installed in the PC, it's going to be very small, not get in the way, etc., etc. especially if you've got a graphics card above it, all those kinds of things. I should say straight away, it doesn't necessarily need to be a PCI Express Times 16 wired slot. So what I mean by that is this is compatible with PCI Express Times 4, Times 8, and Times 16 slots. Now it's Times 16 sized, but they have to be wired to the minimum of PCI Express 4, or Times 4. So yeah, hopefully that makes some sense. Also as well, the PCI Express generation of this Technically, I suppose you would say it's a Gen 3 because most slots are Gen 3, but it will work with Gen 4 and obviously Gen 5 upcoming. I would imagine it's going to be electrically compatible. We don't know because we haven't seen PCI Express Gen 5 slots yet, but certainly for most people, I think if you're trying to add an M.2 drive to a slot in this kind of way, realistically, you're probably going to be on an older PCI Express generation, maybe 2 or 3. But anyway, with that out of the way, let's take a look at it and I'll explain to you my frustrations. So in the box, what do you actually get? So you don't get a drive, that is mine, I'll put that to one side, ignore that entirely. So you do get the obvious things, so you get a little uh, leaflet there about how to get in touch with Sabrin and how to share the love. You also get a very kind of basic instruction guide or installation manual, which is actually part of the reason why I'm doing this video, just to clarify a few things which are not in any way, shape or form clear from the instruction manual. You also get included a little handy screwdriver for doing up those M.2 slots and that kind of stuff and for actually disassembling the drive caddy itself. This is where it starts getting a little bit weird. So these are basically M.2 thermal pads or just thermal pads. They're double-sided adhesive and you get three of them. Now one of them you get is around about 1.5 millimeters. This one is, not, I wouldn't even hesitate to guess, maybe 0.5 and this one's probably about 0.5 as well. So they're very narrow two tiny little ones and one thick one. So this is where it starts getting strange because it doesn't actually tell you in the manual where these actually go, where you should put them on the device itself. So let's take a look at the device and things will probably become a little bit more transparent. So this is the actual device itself. This is actually pretty cost effective, around about 15 pounds here in the UK from amazon.co.uk. Put some uh, links in the video description. Also as well, some weird things which you, you may notice now, but you'll definitely notice later when we actually power it up. There's four little holes there. Now, at first I was wondering what are they for? Because obviously, clearly they're not going to be for airflow. But there are actually four LEDs on there, which gives you an idea of obviously drive activity, etc., etc. So we'll take a closer look at that later. I'm trying to give you some close-ups of it. The rest of it is pretty much self-explanatory. So we've got some heatsink fins there to dissipate heat from the M.2 drive. You've obviously got your PCI Express mounting area here with the little clip on the end, which you're used to seeing on graphics cards, etc. So that is what latches it into place. So there's no... PCI Express blanking plate or anything that goes on the back there. So again, for neatness, you could put this in a PC and no one would really even know it was there unless they actually physically looked inside. It's all nicely blacked out as well, so that's pretty good. Apart from obviously Sabrent couldn't resist on stuffing their logo on the side there in white on a contrasting background. So yeah, that's all well and good. There are four screws on the back, as you can probably make out, and we'll give you some B-roll this so you can see it a little bit clearer. With the included screwdriver, so you can undo all four screws and we'll take a little look inside and see what it's all about. So with the screws undone, it breaks down into the individual components. So we've got the kind of like the back plate, as you can see there with the four screw holes in there. We've also got the front section, and also you can see inside, 
to the uh, kind of internal section of the actual heatsink itself. Something which some of you may have want to kind of take notice of is the edges are rounded off. As you can see, you probably see this from the close-ups much better, but slightly rounded off. So if you've got a drive similar to the uh, slightly older XPG drives, this is an SX6000 drive, which some of them used to have like a metal plate on the top there, which this one actually has a metal transfer plate, which the XPG logo is put onto. On some of these, the actual square pieces in the corners, you may find actually interfering with some of that, so do bear that in mind. You may need to peel your drive shield off in its entirety, which potentially could invalidate your warranty, so obviously do bear that in mind. The real brains of this operation is uh, this section here. So this is your PCI Express card in its kind of naked form, so you can probably make out there quite easily. That is the M.2 slot there. So this is only going to work for NVMe drives. It will not work for SATA-based M.2 drives. There are loads of other devices on the market which will do that. This particular one is for PCI Express NVMe drives only. So, and also drive sizes only up to 2280, which is this size here. You can if you want to. There is a little uh, point there which you can unscrew and move it down. So if you've got a slightly smaller drive, then you can move it down into those little notches which are lower down. Now, this is where actually it started confusing me already. Other than the fact that those four LEDs on the top, which I kind of thought, well, not too sure what they're there for, but hey-ho. First of all, I thought there was going to be a screw to go into this M.2 mountain pillar, as pretty much every motherboard that I've ever seen and ever looked at has always had one of those little mounting pillars and then a screw that goes into the top of it. What they do slightly differently on this particular version is the screw is actually in the back. So what you need to do is to, first of all, undo that screw. And then the little brass plug there comes off. And I'll try and get you close for this, but it is actually so small, it is ridiculous. There is a, like a little indentation in it. So what you do is you actually get your M.2 drive and it literally just plugs in on the end. So let me do that now. So. To the end there, normally where your bolt would go down through, your screw would go down through, and hopefully you can see that and make it out. You'll see it in some of the close-ups anyway, so it's not a problem. So then what you do is you then put your drive in on a 45 degree angle as you would normally. Wiggle it in and that lowers down into place and then you put the screw back in from the uh, the rear section. It all kind of plops into place and it makes total sense. It didn't at first, it really confused me. I was like, where is the screw? So if you're watching this video thinking, same as I did, where is the screw? What is going on? You don't actually need it. And if you'd have read the instructions like I did eventually, then you'd realize, ah, yeah, that is exactly how it works. So that is very simple and straightforward. If you wanted to, you could just install the drive just like this. And in some instances, that's going to be absolutely fine because it, this one, like I said, it's got the cooling built in, so it isn't uh, necessary to have all this extra stuff. Literally, all we need is a way of getting the M.2 into the PCI Express. So where it starts getting interesting now is actually if you do want to put the thermal section back on. So in the moment, depending on obviously the drive that you're installing, if you've got DRAM or any kind of controllers on the back of the drive, you're going to want to put some sort of thermal interface in there. So this is again where it starts getting interesting. We do have a section here, which has got these kind of gold sections on. So that is designed to transfer heat. So in my mind, what we're doing is putting one of the thinner pieces on. Then we're going to put our drive back in and that would then transfer the heat from the back of the drive into the uh, the setup itself. And then, arguably, this section on the back should transfer then to this section on the back. So again, you'd probably end up using the really thin piece on there and then put the back plate on, etc., etc. Therefore, leaving you with the thick piece to put on the top of the drive as most kind of setups would with this kind of heat sink. But what I find is when I do that, when I put it all back together, those screws aren't long enough to go through all of it together. So this is where it kind of, it falls on its face a little bit. Now it could be because the extra fraction of width that I've got there for that little metal uh, plate, which says XPG on there, it is extremely fine. It's literally kind of like, I don't know, a quarter of a millimeter, if that. It is extremely thin, almost paper thin. So whether or not it would make much difference, I don't know. Of course, obviously what I could do is leave out the uh, the thinner piece on the back here and just hope that this, when it's screwed up, actually does touch the back in some way. There's not a great deal of heat generated from the back of the drive in this particular instance because there's very little on there. 
there's two chips at the end which will probably touch that eventually but yeah it's not exactly foolproof so i think what is the best thing for me to do now is i'm going to try and work out with these thermal pads what actually works and what doesn't we'll pause the video now and then we'll come back a little bit later on with kind of what works for me in this particular setup obviously again yours may be slightly different hence why it would have been really nice for sabrent being that they actually make drives themselves they could have just saved us all this hassle and actually said right this is what you need to do this is where things need to go obviously the whole point of this if you look at it as a heat sink is is designed to transfer heat away which is kind of its secondary or in some instances primary goal so yeah to admit that i think is a little bit weird Anyway, I'm going to stop moaning, we'll stop the video now, and we'll be back shortly. Okay, so I've actually remedied the problem, and this is the uh, the finished article. I did actually remove the old drive, which was the, uh, the XPG one, which is this one. It just simply wasn't going to fit in there, and without taking off this metal enclosure, or the metal kind of top piece, it wasn't going to fit. So I went with another drive which I had, which actually does need to go into a computer. This is just a bare drive, and actually it fitted in... Uh, pretty nicely hopefully it's going to focus on that but anyway so that is the slot that we're going to be installing it into this pci express time 16 slot at the bottom it is only wired for eight in this particular one so we're not going to need to uh, take off anything from the back here it's going to be absolutely fine so i'm going to turn the pc off and then insert it and we'll see what it looks like when it's lit up so it's going to press down on the uh, retention arm there just to hold hold it in place shortly line it up in there Stick it in and that's it, locked into position. And that was it, super, super fast. So let's turn the, uh, the PC back on. I'll be interested to see if we actually get any illumination on those LEDs on the side where that Sabrent logo is. And there we go, that looks pretty nice actually, pretty uh, pretty discreet. Despite my misgivings about the actual installation process, it does look pretty nice in there. And there we go, so we're actually transferring some data now across the drive and it's actually lighting up blue there's four blue leds on there to show disk activity as it would appear and um, we're currently transferring in the system at somewhere in the region of about about one gigabyte per second across that pci express gen 3 bus although the lights don't exactly look like they're changing in relation to what windows is actually doing so currently we're down slightly slower speed 800 megabytes per second because there's some slightly smaller files. Back up to one gig per second. Now the lights don't seem to be doing actually anything else. So I'm not entirely sure whether there's four lights on there. Whether that's saying that it's PCI Express Gen 3 times four. It's using a times four bandwidth, I don't know. I'm not entirely sure. I don't have a slot which actually has less than times four on it, so impossible to tell. There we go, it's actually finished transferring now. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so we're back and it's actually the next day. Now, I've done a load of footage, which uh, I'm not going to bore you with because the results are pretty weird. So let's just wrap things up. This is a really hard thing to install and to actually get right first time. So I went through a few different variations with different drives. So we went with the silicon powered two terabyte one, which is what I would consider a normal modern drive. So it just has a label on it and that is it. Also with the XPG, which... Uh, did manage to get to fit but not particularly well the real takeaway of this is those thermal pads now depending on your drive setup and how you actually install it etc etc your results may be drastically different now i did one test and it ended up with the actual drive being about 12 degrees hotter than the other drive in the system which was underneath the frother slot in the pc behind me so this is really not a good thing if you spent 15 pounds on a drive enclosure or mounting kit and for it to actually be hotter than it would be in normal open air, obviously something has gone very wrong. So the thermal pad is not making contact, it's not transferring heat to the outside edge, and it's not getting cooled. So this is worst case scenario, and in a lot of cases will probably give you worse performance than it would just a bare drive on its own. So in that respect, I can wholeheartedly recommend this because of the complexity of actually getting those pads right. You may even need to use things like some sort of measuring device to actually see what the gaps are between the various components. You may even need to replace the screws so you can get all three of the pads actually installed at the same time in order to get the cooling absolutely right. Now obviously, when drives report the temperatures back to the system, there's a kind of like an overall picture of the actual temperature. 
This isn't going to give you any idea of certain hotspots on particular chips if they're not being covered or not being correctly applied with that thermal pad. So it is a little bit risky, especially if you've got a particularly expensive drive, which you basically don't want to die prematurely. So I would say for most people, this is going to be fine if you're going to keep this in your kind of kit bag for an emergency purposes, if you need to transfer some data and someone hasn't got an available slot, just to put it in as a bare drive without the actual enclosure around the outside. It works absolutely fine and temperatures are probably only about three or four degrees more than a regular drive underneath one of those frozer slots or a built-in M.2 shield, that kind of thing. So for kind of yeah, engineers and techies, that kind of stuff, you just want to transfer some data and need a quick and easy way of doing it. This is definitely an option, although there are obviously other options such as the USB one, which uh, Ugly Bob kindly provided us with, which you can check out up here. And also we did one from Easy DOI as well, which is a PCI Express version, which doesn't have a cooling method, but certainly is considerably easier to actually set up the drives, etc., etc. So yeah, mixed results. When it actually does work properly, which I have actually managed to get it to work properly with a single thick thermal pad on the drive, and actually the temperatures are about three or four degrees lower than the actual frozer one in the system, which again is like a cooling solution. So it's not brilliant at cooling. And again, your results may vary. 15 pounds, for some of you, it may be a little bit too much money to kind of just waste on something which you're gonna just keep in your kit bag for that opportune moment where you may actually need it. If you like the look of it and the design of it and you're prepared to actually work with it and check all your temperatures, etc., in experiment with different thermal pad sizes, then yeah, definitely go for it. It is a reasonable price. Anyway, that has been my experiences with it. Please do let me know your experiences in the comments section below and let me know what you think. If you think I've done anything wrong in my testing methodology or do you just think that really they need to look at this a bit better and maybe experiment more with thermal pads and actually give you some direction of how to use it. Let me know what you think. I'll be interested to know. But that's going to wrap this one up. I've been Mike. This is Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To. And hopefully we'll catch you in the very next video. Thanks for watching.